project purpose, um, the department, in conjunction with the uh, Department of Housing, Connecticut Department of Housing, obtained a HUD grant in response to Hurricane Sandy. And the HUD grant is, will provide funds for the construction portion of the project, and the funds actually are for the armoring. It's restricted to armoring of the bridge against future flooding, retrofit of existing electrical and mechanical systems is required to, to improve it to get the flood resistance in the future. It has a very limited scope. It's strictly addressing future flooding. And it, the buzzword is resiliency. And, uh, in the past, there have been problems in, in the event of a storm when the bridge is no longer movable, you lose the ability to either get across on 136 if that's non-functional or uh, to be able to access the normal river. Okay. Goals, to repair the existing damage from the previous storm, improve surge water resistance uh, during the high tides that typically occur during a storm event, to provide rapid recovery from storm events to be able to get the water out of it more rapidly, and then to <coughs> minimize construction disruptions to both pedestrian traffic, vehicular traffic, and any marine traffic that uses the Norwalk River. I'll turn it over to Steve now. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so I'm Steve Harlacher. I'm with the designer, Hardest in Hanover. Uh, just a few key aspects about the existing bridge and the existing bridge conditions. Uh, it was built in 1972 uh, with a rehab in 2008. Uh, it carries Route 136 over the Norwalk River. There are four lanes of traffic, two eastbound, two westbound. There's a sidewalk on either side. Uh, the average daily traffic is around 19,000 vehicles per day, a uh, fairly high volume of traffic. And the waterway, as many of you know, is a commercial and recreational traffic through the waterway. The total bridge length is just under 500 feet. Uh, there are three approach spans, uh, one on the west side, then there's the main channel uh, draw span, and then two spans on the east side. Uh, it's a double leaf bascule span is the, is the main channel. Uh, that channel is 100 feet wide navig navigable, navigable channel uh, with a clearance of about 10 and a half feet to mean high water. Uh, during the peak season, you get about, we, we check the logs, about 50 openings per week. And you get that number drops significantly in the off-peak seasons from November to April, where you get around seven. Uh, you know, in the, in the really cold months of uh, December and January and February, sometimes it's as few as two per week. So uh, quite a bit less traffic through the channel during those off-peak hours, um, no, off-peak months, sorry. Uh, the roadway width is 52 feet carrying those four lanes of traffic, and then the overall deck width of the bridge is 65 and a half feet, including the sidewalks. Uh, the the su substructure of the bridge is, is reinforced concrete with stone masonry on the, on the piers and the basket pier. Uh, so just to look at the superstructure, uh, to point out a few aspects of it, if I can. Uh, this is the, the draw span in the open position. Here's a view of the draw span in the closed position. Uh, so the roadway traffic would be permitted in this span, and then this is the River Explorer, I'm oh, sorry, in the, in the open position. Yeah, here's the fendering system along with the front. And then you can see as the bridge opens, there's a, you can see into the machinery spaces of the bridge. Uh, from, the con, from the control house, so you can see the sidewalk is here uh, with the bridge railing and then the four <coughs> lanes of traffic uh, across here. So that's the uh, superstructure of the bridge, of the existing bridge. Uh, the existing substructure, uh, this is a, what we refer to as the bascule pier uh, that houses one of the leaves and then there would be in the foreground there would be another bascule pier for the second of the leaves. Uh, in the background you can see the one approach pier on the east side. Uh, this is a, a view of the, the substructure with the fendering system just behind this and you can see a, the photo is a little bit difficult but you can see there is some stone masonry protecting the tidal region of the bridge. Uh, the existing bascule pits are one of the areas that we're focusing on as part of our rehab. Uh, this is a view from inside the pit. Uh, the channel would be just to the outside on the left side. Uh, there's an inspector walking down the ladder. Directly above is a, is a counterweight 
uh, used to balance the bridge as it goes through its motion. From the fender system, this is the channel side. Uh, you can see a front wall of the bascule pier. This front wall is below the flood elevation. Uh, during a, flood, during a, a high tide event and a storm surge, either a wind blown wave action or water coming down the Norwalk River, uh, it would exceed this limit and water would pour into this open pit and fill it up. That's what happened in Superstorm Sandy. Uh, so, that is a, an area that this rehabilitation project needs to focus on. Um, within the pit, to dewater it, should water get in there, there is a sump pump currently. Uh, that sump pump has a pipe that runs up uh, along to a, uh, you can see a, a uh, platform here with some sump pump controllers. Uh, but that generally is capable of removing water from not a storm event. So water that may get into the pit during a rainfall event, um, or maybe some light, light uh, cresting of the wall, uh, this sump pump can handle it. In the event of a storm like Superstorm Sandy, uh, water would rush in considerably faster than this pump could remove it. Uh, so we need to come up with a way to recover this bridge much more rapidly than using this sump pump. At the existing generator level, this is the emergency backup power for the bridge, uh, and it is vented through louvers in the wall and a, uh, and a, a ventilation duct in the back of the room. Uh, this floor is below that flood level. So if we get the Superstorm Sandy equivalent event again, you're, the, the DOT would have water in this space, and that is a, a concern knowing that this is the backup power. So part of the rehabilitation program is, is to prevent water, preclude water from getting into this space, uh, either through the louvers or through these louvers, or there's a, a hatch in the floor actually in this area, uh, right in the foreground of this, that water could come up through. So all of these aspects would need to be armored to make sure that the department can get this facility moving as quickly as possible after a storm. Uh, ideally, we want to keep the water out to begin with. Um, some existing electrical components, so uh, water and electricity don't mix well. Uh, these are the submarine cables that go from one of the bascule piers to the other bascule pier. They go through the concrete floor, they go down under the channel and up into the other uh, bascule pier. And then these, these uh, cables go into a submarine terminal cabinet here, which is water damaged. So the rehabilitation would need to include removing the, the water damage components within this, uh, this box and uh, rectifying the damage that was done. Uh, back to that sump pump for a minute. Uh, this is the outflow for the sump pump. This, this is a, a penetration through the wall of the bascule pier where any water collected by the sump pump would go up and out the wall. Uh, this is actually below the flood elevation as well. So in an extreme event, water would actually back up and run down this as an, another means. So our sump pump wouldn't be able to get that water out once you reach a certain level. If you continue to rise, you'll actually short out this uh, sump pump control box. So those are some of the existing electrical components which need to be rehabilitated as part of this project. Um, so what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Brian, our project engineer now, and he'll go s over some of the aspects of the proposed construction and uh, get a feel for what the impacts may be. As Steve said, uh, as Steve said, we've got a lot of work to do with the uh, the electrical system, including providing a, a lot of waterproof electrical components. We're going to raise the fender navigation lighting, and we're going to pull out all the existing heaters in the generator room and replace them with something that's well above the flood elevation. Uh, we're also going to take the sump pump exit, and we're going to push that up through the floor of the control house and out to an elevation well above the uh, the flood level. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is waterproof the basket <coughs> of the house. Um, you may have seen in when Steve was showing you the, the basket pits that there was some bird uh, there was bird netting out in front of the basket pier to prevent you know pigeons and things coming in from there. So what we're going to do we're going to push the front wall up. We're going to we're going to build a short wall uh, just above that bird netting and prevent any any water from coming in there. We're going to replace the hatches and, and the doors in the floor uh, with waterproof hatches. And we're actually going to build a stub wall uh, surrounding the entirety of the generator room. So we're going to bring up a, a short wall 
that'll prevent any water from coming in there. Uh, we're also going to provide environmental upgrades that will improve the pit drainage. Uh, any effluents coming from the pit, we're going to clean that uh, to, to the necessary standards before pumping it back into the channel. And, and the big thing here, we're going to provide a deep watering standpipe. We're going to push a, a large diameter pipe through the, the north sidewalk and, um, and in the event of a storm, a major storm, once the, if, if the, uh, the pit doesn't in fact get flooded, uh, we'll be able to bring a, a tra trailer mounted pump over and pump out the, pump out the basket pit uh, significantly faster than the existing sump pump ever would be, would be able to. Um, it's a bit hard to see on this plan, but uh, I've, I've highlighted the basket pits with a dotted orange line. Uh, that's just to signify that all the work that we're going to be doing, you, you basically won't be able to see any of the work uh, from the street level with the exception of the replaced hatches and the standpipe that we're going to put into the, into the sidewalk. Uh, we're going to replace the navigation lighting and, and, and take care of a few other things. Uh, from the elevation of the structure, we're going to see here. Here's the uh, the front wall of the basket pit again, and that's where we're going to raise up the front wall to prevent any water from coming in. Uh, so again, you're not going to see too much from from this view of the the finished structure. Uh, a lot of the work is going to be done inside of the basket pit, uh, with the exception of raising that front wall there. Uh, now, the the top elevation that we're showing. Again, all you're going to see is the raised front wall and the new navigation lighting. And we're also going to replace this door on the, on the pit that accesses out to the fender. Within the pit, we're showing the dewatering standpipe. We're going, to, we're going to do a minor mechanical rehab that was affected previously. We're going to install this oil water separator and, and reroute the, the sump pump so that it comes out at a higher elevation. And we're going to provide a couple more waterproof doors and this short concrete stub wall to prevent water from coming into the generator, <coughs> generator room in the lower control house floor levels. Uh, as far as the maintenance and protection of traffic, we're going to look at a four-week southbound sidewalk and single lane closure, probably the end of April into May 2017. Uh, a one-week northbound sidewalk and single lane closure so that we can put the, the standpipe and we can also replace the hatch in the, in the sidewalk. Uh, during both of these, we're still going to have the other side of the bridge and the, the opposite uh, sidewalk open. There will be periodic short-term full roadway closures with detours that we're going to show in a second. And all of those are going to be scheduled ahead of time and, and, and fully signed. Uh, and there will be periodic short-term off-peak navigation closures, closures. And those are also going to be scheduled. Uh, we're going to try to work around both commercial and uh, and recreational navigation traffic so that we, we work around the tides and, and can make something work. Uh, as far as the traffic detour plan, the, the detours, again, they're going to be scheduled. They're going to be short term, maybe on the order of a few hours at a time. Uh, and both, of, both uh, heading in both directions, we're going to route traffic up and around across 95. So we're going to have to coordinate that with the I-95 Union project that may be taking place at the same time. Uh, as far as the construction site plan, we're, uh, here, here's the bridge right in the center. We've highlighted in green all of the crosswalks, so we're going to have, we're going to have adequate signage any time that we close the bridge. We're going to try to leave both uh, lanes in each direction open as well as at least one sidewalk open during the majority of the construction. As far as the preliminary construction schedule goes, uh, we're going to have mobilization in early 2017. We're going to work on getting the right lead time, lead time to get all the electrical components in-house so that we can replace them all uh, as, as efficiently as possible. And during most of that work, that's when we're going to have the south sidewalk and single lane closure in the westbound direction. So that'll be about four weeks uh, in, in uh, April and May of 2017. Uh, later on, we're going to have the one-week north sidewalk and single lane closure, and, and we're going to make an effort to get this project finished before uh, both the, uh, 
the Oyster Festival and the Boat Show, which are going to be taking place in September of that year. Uh, so during the Boat Show and the Oyster Festival, we're, we're not going to have any closures of any kind. Uh, as far as facility impacts, there are public, uh, the public utilities at the bridge site are unaffected by construction, and we're only going to have uh, electrical service shutdowns that are bridge specific, <coughs> only affecting the bridge uh, itself. There should be no other property, uh, property impacts associated with the project. Uh, and we will be coordinating with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the Office of Long Island Sound Protection, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Coast Guard, Coastal Area Management, Flood Management Certification, and the Harbor Master. Uh, Bob, can I hand it off to you? Sure. The estimated cost for the project is around $2 million. The construction cost will be an 80-20 split. Federal money from HUD grant for the 80%, 20% from the state. Um, the design cost, the part of the work we're in now, is entirely state funded. And uh, then, uh, as you can see, we've got the HUD grant online for the next reimbursement. Schedule again uh, begin in two, the spring of 2017. Uh, most of the work should be done during the summer 2017, and we have to finish up by the end of September, end of summer 2017, in order to uh, meet the requirements of the HUD grant for reimbursement. Um, as Brian had said earlier, this work will be done prior to the Walk Bridge work and also the 102-295, which is the I-95 work.